So I'm extremely honored and very happy to, um, to be with you all this evening and to be sharing the platform with Anna Teresa de Kiersmacher, choreographer, dancer herself, founder of the dance company Rosas, founder of Parts, the school that has taught generations um, to dance, uh, a dancer choreographer with over 40 years of experience and performances worldwide, not only in theaters, not only in the black box, not only in operas, not only in the spaces that we know of for dance, but also, um, and with increasing frequency, in museums. Uh, we are reunited in a way um, because the two of us worked together uh, some five years ago, actually, on uh, the piece Work, Travail, Arbeit, an exhibition as a dance piece, a dance piece as an exhibition um, at Wheels in Brussels. And it's, yeah, my pleasure then to have you back in Basel um, you're not physically in Basel now, but you just were there and rehearsing uh, with your dancers for um, an, an ambitious project at the Fondation Béler. Yes, indeed. I'm very happy myself to be back here, to be back in Basel for this project called Dark Red Basel Béler. Yes. So I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, maybe to ask you to start with about this intriguing title, Dark Red. Well, it's sort of um, nearly simple, too simple. The very starting point was a purely organizational, practical um, reason, namely with Rosas, we do 250 performances a year, all mainly in black boxes. And these projects, the projects for the museum, they had on the planning, they had this color dark red, where others have yellow, blue. And uh, these projects were called dark red projects. And when they asked me, what is the name of this? Uh, I was sort of, let's call it Dark Red, the Dark Red. Initially it was called Dark Red Research Project. I took the research away, but it was looking after the experience, as you said, we started, I started out before a work travail arbeit with uh, Dancing Faza in Tate Modern and in MoMA. Uh, the very first piece I uh, developed was work travail arbeit. And there we worked specifically for the museum uh, space, we transformed from a black box, a piece which was made for a black box for a, uh, the museum space. And um, after that experience, I really started to think, I think it would be good to develop choreographic writing that is specifically interfering with the time and the space of all those different museum space, uh, museums interfering with the architecture, with the different codes of how time and space are organized, but eventually also not for an empty space, but for a museum that has a collection or a museum that has an exhibition. And the first step was in Muka in Antwerp, then we did a project for Brancusi in Beaux-Arts, then there was the important piece that um, the Columba Museum in Cologne invited us, a completely empty space in the beautiful architecture of Peter Zumthor to write a piece that was specific for that architecture and for that museum. Um, and since five years, uh, the people of Basel Baylair have contacted me on a regular basis asking if I wanted to come to Baylair. There was at a certain point in the very specific question of working with Paul Klee uh, but then when this proposition came to connect it to the beautiful architecture of Renzo Piano and after having visited the space and then the idea of working with Rodin and Arp, I accepted the invitation and it became 
dark red basil bay layer. And where initially this color dark red was like sort of efficient, it also came into something. Um, red is like a color of fire and we know what red district is standing for. It is a place where you should not go. It has, in, it, it contains some notion of danger when you, uh, a place where there is maybe things, specifically through the human body, things that should, can be shown, that should not be seen, uh, that is um, a kind of visible, a kind of secret, um, secret space that, that I find quite, quite right. And especially in those times where we move from green zones to yellow zones to red zones. And when the things are really getting dangerous, we go into dark red, into dark red zones and we don't know. So I thought that uh, that was initially as something purely functional it was quite right for this project, you know, because this relationship about the one who looks and the, the, the exchange of gaze, I look at you and the performer is looking at the public is way is so completely different in this wide daylight space of the museum. And it's especially, especially I think in this combination of the work of Rodin and Arp, where the body is so much present and the gaze is so much present and where the moving from this figurative to abstraction is at the core of this exhibition. Um, I, I thought that, yeah, that's the story of dark red and dark red puzzle. I love your answer because it actually says so much about the way you work, which is to say you go from a practical detail, like, you know, dark red is the color of, you know, these projects in your calendar to to kind of understanding. And, and that's also the way you choreograph a bit like you have sometimes as a dancer, there are there are limits. You know, the body has certain limits, limitations. Um, you're given a certain space or time. And then from it, you make something, you know, magical and complex. And you read how those limits turn into something positive, making lemonade out of your lemons. <laughs> well, I, I also think this dark red, it has something, I don't know how you say that in English, it's premonitoire. Something of which was like premonitory, yeah. Premonitory, like sort of it revealed itself, it writes itself, it indicates itself, it invites to a certain reading, especially in these confusing times. Well, I want to ask right sort of at the beginning of this talk about these confusing times, because one of the things that is so particular about the difference between dancing for a theater space, for the black box, where a public comes at a particular time and they sit down and there's a stage and there's a distance between them and what's happening um, on stage. When your dancers are dancing in the museum, one of the things that's so special and particular about it is they can get close to the audience. I remember in our experience working together on work Travail Arbeit, it was a revelation for the public to be able to see visitors sweat, to feel them, the heat of their body, to feel them breathing. And now we are all in this moment when we're made to be afraid of the body, to be afraid of the other, the other's breath, the other's sweat. Um, and I wonder how this, what impact this has, if you can answer it, some parts we know and some we don't yet know, how this impacts dancing in the museum for you. Well, of course, we're in times where not only we mistrust the body of others, but we even mistrust our own body. You know, that, that, that's, I, I think, the most confusing, scaring thing is that we have to rely completely on medicine, on science, on politicians who choreograph how we physically have to relate 
you know, and of course you can dance alone, but organizing the space between pe people, writing the space between people is, is maybe, with the body as a basic instrument, is maybe one of the possible definitions of what, uh, what choreography is. You know, you know, the word choreography comes from the Greek word graphen, which means writing, and chore means the chorus. It's a group of people, you know. So it has a, it's always somehow about a community and the relationship between the individual and the community. So in that sense, I think choreography is not only one of the most contemporary arts, because what is more contemporary as the body? But it's also a potentially very political act, you know. Here we say, you know, this this verticality of our spine, and then this this horizontal line, which is about reaching to each other, touching each other, coming close, sharing the same air, you know. And that is all. That's all. That all goes into the red zone right now. Dark red. It goes into the dark red zone, and you get this from the extreme physical anchored in in the dans la chair to to the most abstract. But um, it, I, I think, this crisis hits the world, society, the arts in many, many existential levels. Of course, it, it hits the dance performance and life performance in the DNA, in the DNA of our practice. And I think even more than in the visual arts, because in the visual arts, work is done. And then you have this object that can be set somewhere, it can be traveled, it stays there, it can be sold, can be speculated upon. But in, in, in dance, the work has to be done over and over again. You know, it's not for nothing that work, travail, arbeit had, had, was the title. And uh, so, for example, in MoMA, there was this exhibition about uh, postmodern dance. And I think quite rightly, the title of it, the, the work has to, has to be done, has to be done over and over again, the embody over and over again this it's really quiet and uh, we are now choreographed and in our daily lives and in our work it's about protocols and it's about distance it's about not sharing so that is all extremely challenging and and i really And of course, it's a blessing that you can work in the museums because there that space is still, it's a kind of luxury. That space is liquid. We can work on duration. Uh, the spectator, he still, he can come close, but not touch. Yeah, you can see, but not touch. And that same is the same as with the sculptures. Uh, we have this access to detail. Um, that's, that's all very beautiful and there is the brightness, the light hides and reveals different things as when you're in a black box, eh? when you're in the evening, the distance is closed, the, the community is organized differently. It's also for the, the ones who perform. I can look into your eyes. You know, when you're on the theater, I can't look into the eyes of... Uh, I can't look into the eyes of the ones who are looking at me. Our gaze, which is maybe the most powerful tool, I think, to sculpture the space. Both the one who performs as the one who looks, but also as a performer, you're... you're your gaze is... Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Oh. Oh, so I thought it was something interfering. The gaze is maybe the most powerful tool 
in how you sculpture the space. And I've been lately working a lot with that. Um, That's really interesting, because on the one hand, if Dark Red, the, the title that you've given for this series of interventions and uh, choreographies that you've imagined for different museums and different exhibitions um, with different artworks as an inspiration, the one for the Fondation Baylor is specifically imagined in relation to this show and this combination of two artists, Rodin and Arp. And I wonder if before... I'd like to show the audience a minute or two of the piece, but before that, I'd like you to say something about how you worked, how in the five years since the Fondation first started contacting you about collaborating on a project, how is it that you um, developed the choreography in relation to the exhibition? Well, the first step was, of course, the visiting of the museum, which I did many years ago when I was on, with my parents still, you know, traveling and, and discovering this beautiful uh, museum. But then uh, I revisited the museum, looked at the architecture of, of Renzo Piano. So that was the first step. Then there was the proposition that was done, okay, in combination with Rodin and Arp. And while uh, Raphael Bouvier. Bouvier was building, developing uh, the exhibition in a very concrete room, there would be 10 rooms, which sculptures would be there, according to which principles would they be brought together. Who's, he shared that with, uh, with me through images, through explanations, we had different talks. So I, uh, I started to imagine uh, a choreography that would anchor on, on exactly the building, content-wise, organizational-wise, like in a, a guided tour, a promenade around that. And we were dating, how do you say, they're checking out as his project developed, I started to uh, develop um, basic material that really in a quite simple way related to in room one, you have this sculpture, that sculpture, according to which principle does he bring them together and how we relate to that. I, of course, had a previous experience with the work of um, of Rodin by in 1994, 96, I made a piece to Arnold Schoensberg Transfigured Night, where I used uh, the sculptures of Rodin and some of the sculptures which are present, like Je suis belle, Femme accroupie, who were present as starting point for writing choreographic material, yeah. Um, that it's it's a quite, you know, Verklärte Nacht is one of the most, it's the last work that Arnold Schoenberg wrote at just before 1900. And it's the last major work of the romantic period before he went into the dodecaphonic serial music, yeah. It is based on a not so good poem where a man and a woman walk in a forest and the woman says to the man that she's pregnant, but from another man. And um, the man after a kind of sort of dramatic reflection says that it doesn't mean, but that this child will transcend their love. So I, I, I took this kind of nearly shamelessly romantic, passionate <laughs> starting point uh, to sort of objectify and take certain poses together with other elements like 
the idea of spiraling up, spiraling down, the idea of men assisting a woman to deliver, to give birth. And that was the way that vocabulary was um, developed. Here, of course, we got a double track. Here is the track of old Rudin's, and then there was the track of Arp, who clearly goes into abstraction in the forms where we don't see faces anymore, we don't see five-fingered hands that can be expressive, yeah, where the whole periphery, where there is no gaze anymore, where there is no, where we we get like, I don't know if you know Alvin Nicolais, he's uh, the American choreographer who made these choreographies in the 60s, where you get purely where literally dance, another possible definition of dance can be moving sculpture or moving architecture. Yeah, and where all the detail of that has to do with the expressive body are wiped out. Yeah, it's about volumes, about shapes, straight lines, curved lines, um, where still in, inspired by nature, but not the human body, or where the human body is, is not wiped out, but that sounds negative but to volumes, shapes, um, full space, empty space, um, surface, and so So I find that a very interesting, uh, very interesting field because that is of course my preference, my, my preferred definition of, of, of choreography is embodied abstraction. Yeah, and so that that was something that was triggering me. That was triggering me and and taking it in a very concrete way. Okay, that's a reflection that inspires that inspires me. Um. And so both both Rodin and Arp were your starting points and the relationships that were constructed room by room exactly. in, throughout the exhibition, the tension even between what you so beautifully described, sort of five-fingered bodies, um, faces, gazes on the one hand. Yeah, the, the and torso, the verticality of the spine, a body that is open in uh, abandonné or that is protecting itself. I mean, it, the... the, the, the oh, it's like physically passionate. There's something which is in Rodin, like so obvious, yeah? So obvious and maybe, I think for us, some of us maybe like disturbing, uh, disturbing obvious, yeah? And, but um, that tension field is very, uh, yeah, really, inspired, triggered me, because it, it goes into the heart of questions I've been asking myself in the last 10 years more and more. Can I bring the audience into your process a bit? Can I have a clip, just a minute, where we look together at your dancers in the Fondation Baylor's space as they dance with exactly these this inspiration that you've described as, as a starting point. Absolutely, on the one condition that we know this is rehearsal. This is rehearsal, this was the working process, it's searching, things weren't finalized yet.
So we've, we've seen we've seen your dancers. These are dancers that have worked with you in your company, um, have trained with you, have learned your vocabulary, and with whom you, um, as is typical of your practice, with whom you choreograph. So you're, uh, I've watched you in the midst of your process. Of course, you have a part of what you do, which is so much your own lexicon, your own vocabulary. But what I find so beautiful is that you also are watching dancers move and incorporating sort of accidents or incorporating gestures that you see and then making it part of the work or letting it impact the work and even involving them sometimes in the thinking about the writing of that choreography. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is really a very a very step-by-step um, -step intensive process with a whole group of people. And mostly, very often, there is a music score that organizes the, the time and where we start with analyzing the music and on the same time, like, developing some improvisational principles to develop vocabulary and grammar, syntaxes. Now, here, there was the score was this core of the exhibition and then we spent um, a lot of time in a very precise way to construct what I call a basic phrase, basic vocabulary that was anchored on the different sculptures alternating between Rodin and Arp, following the, chr the chronology of the piece, uh, of the exhibition not aiming for completion, not avoiding preferences, or oh, we like this more, we like that less, and so making choices in that. And then responsibility of each of the dancers, okay, you take room one, you take room two, you room three, and me giving organizational principles in how to put them in space, and then doing different kind of operations in, okay, let's do a very uh, a version in five counts, five counts, in four counts, in three counts, in two counts, organizing time. Then very often what we do is working on going and retrograding, you know, like turning a film backwards. So I'm, I'm, it's, it's really this thing of, of trying maximizing the minimum. That was something that I had with work travail arbeit. There was still for me, even it was based on the vortex. But one of the principles of dodecaphonic music, like Schoenberg was done, uh, did, is that you take an object and just like in sculptures, you don't create a frontality but you turn it in five directions. And instead of all taking different objects, I say, okay, I take this object, and now we're gonna look at this like this, we're gonna look at this like this, we're gonna look at this like this, there, there. So I try to organize that, that, that in the writing, choreographic writing, people could dumb into the space and this frontality is blurred. Yeah. Of course, there is one thing is that the body has a front and has a back. Yeah? If I turn around, and I'm not speaking to you like this, you see? Yeah? See. So there is a frontality when I communicate with you, I'm speaking like this. But still, I, I can be extremely flat, flexible, and I can be expressive, and there is, there is this torso, there is this spine, and then there is this whole periphery which goes for my hands, for my face, for my eyes, uh, expressive feet, that uh, sculpture the space and that create a different relationship with, with the audience. That's, that's so beautiful because already what you've described is the essential difference, for instance, between a painting exhibition and a sculpture exhibition, where sculpture oh. is meant to be seen in the round. Yes. And of course, sculpture has a backside, usually, almost always, but sometimes that backside is as important or as expressive as a front side. Yeah. 
I, I, if I'm not mistaken, there's some people like Brancusi, and so they, with the whole use of the pied de stal, that he used like turning things so that you could rotate around. Um, I think it was here, like actually beautiful combination and beautiful possibility that's open. So you remember in work travail Arbeit, is that the dancers were like spiraling around the spec, the spectators. So here I took, um, I especially I want to start from stillness in space, and make it turn it like on a pedestal so the audience can turn around. So we can spiral around each other. The audience can spiral around the dancer and the dancer can spiral around the audience. So you get like opposite helix, you know, which, which I think is very uh, beautiful because it makes really, it really makes a, a, a beautiful tension field with the exhibition exhibition spaces, this beautiful big room 10 in Bel Air, which has this kind of transparent whiteness with a beautiful wooden floor. And, and, and then there is also this whole relationship with the sound, because of course the images don't go through the walls, although everything what you've seen first in the exhibition and you arrive to that room 10, I think you, the previous rooms are engraved in your, on your, uh, not Netflix, but on your, uh, <laughs> what's Net <laughs> Netflix, they say in Flemish, you know. But uh, there is also the use of sound, it's mainly silence, and now and then some music emerges. Some music emerges, which I don't want to reveal now yet which music, but the sound of course, the presence of sound in a museum is an important thing, you know. Uh, it uh, and it goes, it travels through the walls and through the entire museum space. Yeah. So practically speaking, imagine that a visitor when museums are open, <laughs> that um, a visitor comes to see Rodin Arp and they go through the ten or the nine rooms of the exhibition and then quite without knowing it, they arrive in the tenth and there your dancers are performing. Yes. And they are live as long as the exhibition is live for the duration of a few weeks. Yes. So they're not coming to a performance at a particular time and they're not sitting no. down. There's no place for them. They're just able to walk through this space where your dancers are occupying the space, performing live for, you know, from morning until evening. Yes. What is what we're looking for now is some difference with work travail Arbeit. In work travail Arbeit, it was completely continuous. And every hour there was a, a cycle change, you know, there was a cycle of nine hours. Here, here there are sequences with small empty interventions of maybe visually or nothingness. That is still something that we're watching that we are articulating now. I mean, I discovered really there are many different ways to occupy that time in a museum and to occupy that duration. You know, like when we did in Dusseldorf, we had every hour there was some a different part of Fasa happening. Um, I'm still in the midst of how that articulation will be exactly. But there is continuity, and there is the repeat of the same, but always different. Yeah. Well, it's such a privilege to be able to be speaking with a dancer choreographer at the moment when enough has been done, enough has been written, enough has been rehearsed, that there's a shape, there's a form for what will happen, but you're still in the process 
having just returned from Basel um, and having just been in the midst of all of these sculptures, you're still in the process of working at this writing and this vocabulary. And then, and before it's actually public, before it's ready to be public. Yes. You know what I wanted to say also, you know, it was also by being in the, in the exhibition and for the first time really not working with painting, but working with sculptures. This is one of those, the, the idea, how do you say that in English? Um, in mal? A, a, a mold? A mold? A mold? Yeah, a mold. You know, like for example, from the kiss, there are many different casts. Casts Please. existing in, in plaster, in bronze, in, you know, um, that is something really specifically specific of, of sculpture. No, I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So that was also something that was quite inspiring for working with the same writing done by different dancers. You know, there is like an underlying skeleton. A skeleton is a little bit dry, but there is like a framework that unifies, harmonizes the way how all those different dan uh, dancers embody the same material. You know, man, woman, younger man, younger woman, um, well, even the question man, woman is like questioned, yeah. Uh, but you, you see the same and it's different. It, it's different on, with all those different bodies, the, the different personalities of those dancers, and especially different combinations also. It mainly, it mainly are solos, like you have solo sculptures. There are some duets, you know, two, two bodies together. There is en passage, emerging three. And then we have the whole group, like a big atelier where all those different sculptures are standing. You know, where you have the kind of caves and difference of all those different bodies doing the same movements that carry the same shapes that refer to all those sculptures, you know. But uh, in the exhibition also you see not only different, same ideas that are embodied in different ways, but you see sometimes it's identical. Like, I think there are three different versions of the kiss. Yeah, there is one standing outside. Uh, so all this, all this is like this ongoing process of discovering different ways of how to construct the dance, being inspired by by the museum space, these exhibitions, the architecture of the space, the specific, what makes this artist Rodin specific, art specific. Um, how do we look at that? What are the codes that we're looking at it? Um, yeah. One of the things that I found so beautiful um, watching uh, the rehearsals um, and the the, the footage as well of, of kind of the, the piece being written within the spaces is as a visitor or as an onlooker, you have moments where you think you recognize like, ah, that looks like the bodies are coming into the form of Rodin's kiss, for instance. Yeah. But then because they're moving and because they're fluid and liquid, unlike this frozen sculpture, you, as soon as you think you recognize something, it falls out of recognition. And so you can never be sure. It's not like copying. It's not one-to-one. -one. That is, of course, the first thing that you want to avoid, is that you copy the shapes. But there is something like passing through the shapes. 
and it's very much the the if you have all those static shapes it's very much about the space between and the trajectory and the movement between you know the path between one to the other uh, and how that sort of spirals in the space and at which speed you can do it how uh, how those it's it's also it was a very beautiful thing about unstable situations you know you don't all those sculptures are mainly made very often like a frozen movement where gravity is defied you know and you don't want the sculpture to fall because then it would break apart but as dancers defying gravity that's our basic that's your business it's our basic business which is like philosophically also defying gravity we want to fly yeah we want to fly and we want to organize things basically on two axes a vertical axe and a horizontal axe that's our the that's our main business yeah and yeah maybe also about texture texture is a texture you know this whiteness of the marble or of the plaster of or the bronze and here you have this texture that was also something most of those cultures are always naked bodies no i wanted to ask you about that in particular in relation to your costuming yes because you're so precise in every piece you've you've done with how your dancers are dancing, even wh how, what they're wearing, even if it looks like nonchalant and looks not thought of at all. In fact, every shoestring, the color of dancers' underwear that you might see through yeah, yeah. their clothes is, is chosen. And here is no different. Yeah. Well, yes, of course, and here of, was also the very presence of skin. Uh, dress and undress dress and undress myself dress and undress you um, this is all about it's sort of glorifying and minimalism and what the body is pos is present is, is 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 capable of what the body is capable of and in detail allowing the visitors that luxury to see that from clothes in all its beauty sensuality but also fragility what the time leaves as traces on the body how the body that space between bodies goes um, yeah that is um, that's really something that fascinates me and uh, when you come from all those spaces and which are beautifully shaped in in Bay Lair, the way it is done with those wide walls, the slight gray walls, the black walls. Uh, it, it gives a kind of beautiful transparent reading of those sculptures. And then you come in this room and there you see real bodies and real skin. And, And you've chosen, for instance, to have the men, some of the men shirtless, the women wearing nude sort of um, tops. Yeah, yeah, it's, I, I find it, I find it's a really delicate point, I find. Because, yeah, ultimately you would like to be completely nude. Yeah. Uh, but in the same way, It's not that I'm prude, but it's a delicate thing about intimacy. Intimacy and and it's also something I leave it very much also open to 
what the performers themselves feel comfortable with. You know, it's a question when we work on the costumes. It's never something I impose, but it's something I suggest. You know, I mean, we're not like Isadora Dunker or Aloy Fuller who worked with clothes, but clothes are, 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 are very important in the way how they merge with the environment in terms of color, in, in terms of how they enlarge movement, in what they reveal, what they hide, if they're transparent. Yeah. And and how they how they show intimacy and um, what they show, what they don't show, how their daily daily life how their daily costumes, yeah. How they underline something, if they're close to the body, if they underline the, the, the bone structure, if they, yeah. I mean, I, I do also go to my experience myself as a dancer is that I, I really, I think it's really important that you, this is like a second skin. Yeah, and it's very much about also the gaze of the spectator on my body. And I want to, I want that the performer is in, is in possession of that, you know, that he can, is in a complete safe place, how to, show that, not show that. It's also, there was a number of very practical things, like for example, all those sculptures, they're always in one color, you know. There is not like any of those sculptures has like, under the, the lower body is in dark and then the upper body is in white, you see? Because they're all in one material. Bronze, they're all in one material. One marble or... mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was also delicate. In general, I, I like that the silhouette, like in a fashion show, that you, you, you construct silhouettes, you know, and all the different aspects of how the clothing merges with the body is really important. Also, um, during the press conference, you said something really beautiful about how what was important to you in thinking about this piece or constructing it was less, you know, about... Of course, it's not about imitating any one sculpture, but imagining the, the, the space in between or like how a sculpture moved, you know, how the bodies represented or the forms represented moved into either the next sculpture or into stillness or into another space. Yes. And I found that so provocative to imagine your dancers kind of becoming the, a script of what's in between every one of the sculptures in the Fondation Baylor's exhibition. Yes, that was really, that was work like, that was exactly the work we spend a lot of time in, is the, the first step was reconstructing those shapes and then the space in between. And it was done in a very individual way that we shared with the totality of the group. There were a number of nearly geometrical sculptural principles, like, for example, the change of axe, which was done on five, on a, a penta, pentagon, pentagram, pentagon? Pentagram. Pentagram, pentagram yeah. So, which is uh, pentagram basis of a dodecahedron, which is the most closest to a sphere, so that the whole thing turned counterclockwise constantly and uh, yeah I, I liked we, we spent maybe more like about we spend a, lo a lot of time on detail in sculpting the movement on detail you know the difference between this or this or uh, between this or this you know that I think there was a lot of detail work, which was, 
and there was like they created like the a very solid base for the whole group that you share that base together and then the more this base this is the house we work from and then everybody on an individual base can we can start to play you know we can start to play okay what what is your what is your interpretation of that what are your devices that you can play as a solo as a duet that were the things and then there was always this regular moment saying now we come together now we come together and we join by a very simple unisono by a very simple duetting you know we join these elements of uh, So it's a balance between the group and the individual, which is, I think, at the heart, at the, the core of the problems we're facing now is how we can, with so many people, organize our space and our time and how we can, how we can take care of each other and how we can still have individual freedom. And this is... Um, this has been extremely challenging and it, I think for all of us it has been getting extremely emotional, you know, because it, 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 it hits our very DNA, who we are, where we come from and where, what kind of living are we going to go in the next decades, you know, as a, if we want to live with seven... 7.8 billion people is that it yeah so that that is yeah yeah i don't want to get pathetic about it but uh, oh but i find i find it very poignant very beautiful that in the midst of of exactly a moment when when we are being told by everything, the media, the newspapers we read, the statistics that we're coming on, that we're being told that we have to, um, as you said beautifully, be afraid not only of the other's body, but of our own, mm -hmm. that, that you are standing for this project and going forward with trying to make it possible for us to remember what it was like to share space with others, to be a community, um, to be a social body, um, and to to celebrate the beauty that is art in in its every form, whether it's the visual arts, whether it's the performed arts, um, which takes, of course, the people making the things, but also takes an audience that shows up. I know, especially that we are, of course, in the history in the history of mankind. And I think in the next decade, artificial intelligence, technology, robots are, they're already a big part of our daily lives and they're <clears throat> at the top of our fingers and they're part of our, listen, what we're doing now here, you know, it's true and we're very happy we can do it, but it's, it's at the core of, it's a big question mark. You know, we don't want to get, we don't want to go back to ancient times, but how are we going to deal with that modern technology and what is the place of the human body going to be in that? You know, it's, it's, it's one of the biggest questions. I mean, life on earth will go on, but what is the place of humans in that? And the basic house of those humans is are those bodies, you know, are those bodies that are constantly questioning their identity, or is their identity defined? Um, so, what is what is the essence of our our, our being human? Is it uh, is it completely disappearing, changing now? I, I think we're really at a crucial point in relationship to that. I mean, it always has been evolving. I mean, 
it was never a static thing. But I think you, we get to a spiral of acceleration where we are the turning point. And I must sa say that um, uh, by moments like, yeah, um, I'm not nostalgically lost, but but yeah, I I uh, I don't know anymore. So I I come back to that house where I'm getting where I wake up every morning. And that is my harbor, and that defines in the first place my relationship to my environment. Yeah. The body, beautiful. We've we've taken about an hour. We could end there, um, but if but I wonder if there is something more that you would like to say about this project to wrap up, or about dancing in in a museum that sort of has changed because we, we referred throughout this conversation again and again to work Travailarbeit. And I realized for a public who may not know that project, um, it maybe wasn't so clear, or understandable that, of course, Anne Teresa de Kirsmacher has danced, has been invited to dance in different museums, but uh, very often it brought pieces imagined for the theater into a museum space. And I think something that work travail by sort of initiated was thinking about how to create a piece specifically for a museum, but also how to create a piece thinking of museum time and duration in a different way. Mm -hmm. And this project with the Fondation Bayler is the perfect continuation of that because it is it is something that can't easily then go back to theater because it was imagined in relation to these spaces, these artworks, the experience of coming through an exhibition, or could you imagine one day taking, going in the, re in the inverse, taking the well, dark red projects and going to stage? It is actually, it is actually uh, a question I ask myself, and it's not impossible that now the opposite, the opposite operation would happen. I must say that um, I'm very happy because I learn a lot. I mean, music has been my main partner. You know, I've been developing different strategics in the relationship to musics of all different times, from the 12th century to, uh, to music of today. I always skipped a romantic area. I never did 19th century music. But I must say it's extremely inspiring and to go now to a partner which is the history of, of visual arts and uh, to look at that and I think people people I always said people have always danced at the big moments of life and they always sung but I think people have always taken their finger and started to draw a spiral in the sand, you know, when they were sitting next to the beach or they took a, a stone or they took a little stick and started to make patterns or they, so the, to use that is, has been, in the same way that music has always reflected the way people were standing in the world, their perception of the world. In the same way, painting, sculpture, visual arts have always reflected how people were in the world and what their questions there were about the past, the present and the, how in they imagined the future you know, how they looked at her, themselves. What were the ideas they wanted to embody? So that has been, it's like the big, 
work time at Arvid was like the beginning of a new of a new discovery and new possibilities and and that's very uh, that's nice that's nice even though the mechanics are very different between those two worlds different as between music and dance you know but but still it's uh, inspiring exciting as they say in broadway <laughs> yeah revealing challenging um changing so yes well i absolutely can't wait um as soon as museums can open again as soon as we can safely gather safely be within spaces, share each other's breath. Um, we will, we, I know I certainly will, and I guess everyone watching will want to be there to see your dancers live um, in the space, uh, having just now learned about this trajectory that brought you from already having been inspired by Rodin's work in, in an earlier piece of yours to now having really worked over the last few years, accompanied, accompanying the preparation of this extraordinary exhibition between Arp and Rodin and having developed a choreography kind of in tandem with the exhibition. Um, so I'm, I can't wait to see it. Me neither. Thank you, Elena. And Pleasure. I hope we see each other soon in Rodin Alp, Basel Bel Air. In the flesh. In the flesh. <laughs>